Okay, let me begin by a, a, an apology. Economists come and talk to you about how the conditions are, what's some history or something, and in the back of your minds you're thinking, hmm, these are the same, this is the same profession that missed the housing bust and the, and, and the housing, the whole stock market collapse and the huge great recession of 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, and on and on. So what makes it any better now? What does this guy know now? Well, at least I'm now contrite. So I come with an apology and I tell you, look, uh, I, I thought a lot about why we missed the boat, if you will, back then, right? And uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons, but I think the key reason really has to do with housing finance. There's hubris, you know, the young economists think they're smarter than the old ones, and we believe our own econometric models too much, and so we don't believe that they're ever wrong because we make them, they must be right. But the biggest one's housing finance. And you, you think of housing finance, think of it this way. Think of two people. There's, there's you. What's your name is? Tanya. Tanya. There's Tanya, and there's Brian. the guy who licks his fingers, Brian, yes. Okay, so Brian's a bit of a slob and he's not very responsible and doesn't, he runs fast and loose with his finances and so on. He buys a house somewhere in Kenwick or Pasco, whatever, and uh, costs, let's make up a number, make, it, make the math easy, a quarter million. And you put down, you, you, you put down nothing because you get 110% no doc, option only arm. Sounds great. Right, sounds good, right? You had no job either, but no one cared. <laughs> it was a ninja loan to boot, right? No income, no job, whatever. Now you got two options. So you, 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 got, you, got, you got an extra 10%, 25,000 bucks. You bought a car, maybe a small car, and a flat screen TV and went to Hawaii or something. By contrast, Tonya here, Tonya? Tonya. Tonya, T A. T O. T O, Tonya, okay. Was, is, is, is very responsible. She does the right thing. She saved up 50,000 bucks. She plopped the money down. She wants her neighborhood to work out because you've made a huge investment in the community. This guy, by contrast, has two options on that house, a call option and a put option. If the house price goes up, he, he pays the mortgage and you essentially exercise the call option and you keep the house. But if the mortgage, if the house price craters, like a lot of them did, not so much here, but elsewhere, you say, yeah, you know what? Let's not keep the house. Let's pop the keys in the envelope lick the envelope and mail it off to somebody and then they can sue each other. Fannie can sue Freddie, can sue the federal government and then JP Morgan can pay 12 billion dollars because of fraud or something, right? Okay, but we're not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, economists didn't notice or didn't even think of thinking about the difference between these two buyers. We thought, he got money, that's good. She got money, it's good too. But there's a massive amount of behavioral difference in an owner and a renter in drag, right? I mean, that's what's going on. So, look, I admit, as a profession, we made some boo-boos, I'm sorry, but you can't sue me. Like a lawyer, you sue, a doctor, you sue, an engineer, you sue, economist, you get apologies. At least you've gotten an apology. <laughs> Consider this the best it gets. Kidding aside, what I want to talk about here is, first of all, it's retrospective, not prospective. So we actually know how many homes were built last year. We look at 1,000 units because that's sort of the very low end. You look at the worst year of housing activity here in the Tri-Cities area, we never got single fam activity below 1,000 units. So this is, this is an underestimate of what's going on, but you can just bump it up, multiply it by one or two to get the real numbers. And what I want, the, the key point of this presentation is to look at the overall benefits housing brings to a community. We know houses pay property taxes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we know they pay some school taxes and their property taxes. But there are many more benefits housing brings to a community than just simply taxes. And there are also lots of costs houses force a community to incur. And the question becomes, does housing pay its way? That's the key issue. Is housing economically, we can argue about the people who live there, we can argue about how, what the houses look like, we can argue about where they're located, that's a different conversation. But this conversation we're gonna have today says, if you bring in a thousand households, you build a thousand homes, bring in a thousand households essentially, is the community financially better off than they would be otherwise, assuming they have jobs? It's a bit of an assumption, I know, but not much of a big one now. It was six, seven years ago, not so much again in the Tri-Cities, but nationally a big issue because we built homes. It turned out in 2006 and 2007, for those of you who are interested, we just built homes for nobody. We just thought it was fun to build homes so much, we built homes for nobody. Now, we're not doing that now. So let's start and think about, let's try and think about the housing business, if you will, in a systematic way. There are three steps in, the, in, in, in thinking about the benefits of what home brings to a community. There's the construction phase, pretty obvious phase, right? 
you, builders hire people, builders and developers buy stuff, and builders and developers pay local governments fees and permit costs and so on and so forth. This is obvious, we all understand this, and we all know this. And regrettably, all too often, this is where we really stop thinking about the benefits housing brings to a community. These are obvious and we're aware of them and that's why we think about them, but the rest we don't pay much attention to. But there's a huge secondary effect. Let's suppose you, sir, are a home builder, and uh, I hire you to do sheetrocking for me, okay? Or you hire me or whatever it is, right? So I pay you money every two weeks. What do you do with that money? Do you take it and stick it in the ground in Coke bottles or do you spend it? Um, my wife spends Your it. Your wife spends it, okay, good, good answer, good answer. I'll be calling on you more often. Right, now as long as the money gets spent, this leads to ripple effects throughout the community. People earn money in the construction phase, whatever, whatever it is they are, whether they're, they're workers directly on site, whether they work for a lumber yard, or it's a government collecting fees and taxes, the government spend the money too. And this money ripples through the economy, and it ripples through a little more, and so on. And we'll discuss that in some detail a little bit later on. But a secondary effect. This lasts eight or nine months, as long as the home is being built, and then the effect is over, right? This effect lasts eight or nine months, because every two weeks I'm paying you, and every two weeks your wife is spending all the money. And maybe a little extra, because she's American, right? And we borrow money from Japan or something to make it all work. Yeah, okay. We outsource savings in America. It's not something we do anymore. <laughs> Lastly, there's the occupancy phase. This is the phase where the household moves into the house. It can be a single-family detached house, an attached house, a rental, a rental apartment, a low-income housing tax credit, a condo. It doesn't, for argument's sake, it doesn't really matter. Just that we need a house, we build a house, someone moves in. And now what does this, this family do? Every two weeks, they get paid as a family, and then they spend their money, much of it in the community. Sure, they buy a car. The car is not made here in town, but there's profit to the, 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 the owner of, the, of, the, of the, the car dealership, and the, the salesman or woman who sells the car, they get commissioned and so on, and there's a car repairs, and there's the gas station owner, and so on and so forth. If you add up all these benefits, it's tremendously large. Again, eight or nine months of benefit, eight or nine months of benefit in their end, this one goes on forever. To think about how large these benefits are, think of it this way. The construction phase is, I'm six feet with heels, about six feet tall. So that's the construction phase. The ripple phase is roughly half as big. It depends on the place and the tax situation, but roughly half as big. And the occupancy phase is roughly half as big again, down to there. The difference is this phase and this phase are short term. They last eight or nine months as long as the home is built and then they're done. By contrast, the occupancy phase right there, this one goes on forever because the home is once it's built, it's, pre it's presumably occupied almost all the time. There are people who come here for vacation, but most people who come here live here full time around. So the, over time, this becomes the largest effect. This is, you know, imagine this is four dollars, make up a number four. This is half as big two, half as big one. But after six years, the one becomes bigger than the six, right? And in the short run, you get the four and two together, you get six dollars of stimulus in the very short run, followed by one dollar stimulus all the way thereafter. And we have to pick up all these benefits. Now, you may wonder why I'm including the occupancy effect. It seems disingenuous. The builders have nothing to do with this phase. This they do, this is their risk, or they're borrowing money, or they're building for a, for a pr 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 prospective buyer directly, for a custom home builder, custom buyer, or, or something. And the ripple effect comes from that effect, terrific. But this occupancy phase seems like I'm, I'm pulling things. This is not legitimately a home builder activity. This is just economic activity that goes on. Every household does this. Ah, the reason I'm including it is because we're eventually gonna look at the cost side. And we're gonna look at, we wanna look at all the benefits the housing brings, short run benefits, and long run benefits, and then from it subtract all the costs. But this is the key kicker cost that government cares about. Vacant homes don't by and large require a lot of costs. There's not a lot of expending, local spending on empty homes. A little bit for vandalism, I suppose, because there's copper, people stealing copper, and there could be, a, a now with marijuana legal in the state, empty homes could be a great place to deal with marijuana. I don't know, I'm joking. 
there are laws on, dis on dispensaries. I understand that. I know that. And if it's federal law and all that kind of stuff. But you get the point. Vacant homes do bring in some problems, obviously. But there's no school. There's no water. There's no sewer for vacant homes. So once the household moves into the home, that's when public services start really have to be provided. So we've got to capture the benefits the home brings at the, during those beginning phases and the occupancy phase, and then subtract the costs in this phase and those phases and so on, and put it all together. So that's why it's there. Now, how do I do that? Oh, there you go. I'm not saying just build homes. I think I've made that somewhat clear already. The key thing is we're building homes for people. These people have incomes that they, they, which, which enable them to pay the mortgage on the house or pay cash for the house conceivably. They've come here from a different state or they're retired or they have a trust fund or something, but they're not going to default on the house. That's important to point out. I'm not saying just build homes. If it was just a matter of building homes, by the way, Las Vegas in 2008 and 9 would have been the paragon of economic success, right? I mean, so we, I, I get the point. Now, I want to think a little bit more deeply about these three phases that I talked about. So here's the construction phase. And the way it works is as follows. A, bank, a, a builder goes to a banker. Let's keep it simple. Think of it as a spec house. It can be a custom house. It doesn't matter. But let's keep it simple. A builder goes to a banker and borrows money. We're building your house, Tanya, the cost of a quarter million dollars. And the builder borrows, let's make the math really easy, borrows the full quarter million dollars. Develops the land builds a house, sells the house to you, all right? All the money that the builder borrows, every cent of it, touches the local community in one way or another. Some touches it more strongly than others. For example, I hire a worker like you, and you rent an apartment from you, Christina. Christine? Christina? Christina. My eyesight's going. Christina. <laughs> I can tell you're beautiful, but I can't read your name tag. So because I'm paying you, a large chunk of your income goes to her as rent. And that, a lot of that money stays, in the, stays in, the, in the community. By contrast, you're a gas station owner. I fill my Ford F-250 with gas from your gas station. But most of the money that I pay you leaves the community because the gas comes from Canada or something. You make like one penny a gallon on the profit. I buy a pack of cigarettes. That's where you really make a lot of money. And the, the person behind the cash register makes, it, makes eight, ten bucks an hour too. But most of the money leaves the community. So in this case, there's massive stimulus to the economy in forms of rent from my employee. In this case, there's almost no stimulus to the local, just a little, little bit. If you know how much there is in each case and you can figure this out, trust me, it's not quite that hard. You can figure out how much of the money that's borrowed it all runs through the economy. At the end, it leads to income and for local residents and taxes. A lot of income in your case, very little income in your case, but nonetheless, in every case, there's always some income and some taxes. If you add up all that, you get income for local residents, taxes for local governments, and that's the end of phase one. Every two weeks, this happens. I get a draw from the bank, I pay my workers, they, 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 they get this, and they start to spend the money. What happens in phase two now? In phase two, the people who earn the money, people who've earned the money, now start to spend it. So by saving money, by buying things not made locally like gas or going out of town directly, some of the money leaks out of the economy. That's why the ripple effect is only half as big as the construction effect. Right? It can never be as big as the construction effect. It can't be. It's impossible. If the ripple phase were bigger than the construction phase, you'd have a perpetual economic motion machine where a dollar in leads to a dollar five out or some crazy number. But this is that's the ripple phase. And then comes the occupancy phase. And here, uh, here we go. Household gets money every two weeks. They spend the money. It runs through the economy. It leads to income and taxes on the first phase. So I earn my paycheck from my employer. Great, I spend money, but now the place I spend my money on, they start spending money. That leads to the cumulative ripple phase that's this big that happens every, every two weeks or every year and goes on and on and on. Construction short term, eight or nine months ripple, eight or nine months short term, long term occupancy effect that goes forever. Those are the sums of the benefits. Now, in this particular case, we're looking at all construction activity in the whole area, right? Couple of counties, Benton County, Franklin County. We're trying to get a picture of what's going on in the entire metropolitan area. We're looking at the average weighted average price across the entire two county area. So we're picking up what's going on. All right, so if we know obviously there's more being built in here and certain areas are more hot than others, naturally that's always the case. But we're picking up all the effect. We're going to look at all the benefits and then subsequently all the costs across the entire area. So it's important to point that out. Now, let's, there's one other reason why the multiplier is not so big. And this is important to think about. The fourth reason 
is this model that the home builders put out is very careful to account for the marginal benefits to the community that accrue from these new homes being built. So because we build more houses, we get more haircuts. We build more houses, we get more gas stations, we get more banks, we get more supermarkets. That's all causal. So we have to convince ourselves that the reason this ent enterprise is now here and expanding is because the new households are here and it's the new households that are generating the extra revenue for those businesses. So if you look at these, it's pretty obvious. Every new home, while it's being built and as long as it's occupied for 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 years, is going to need almost all of these most of the time. Not always, but many of them much of the time. By contrast, this is different. I mean, the best example is Hanford. There's lots of people working in Hanford. They make a lot of money. It's a really good paying job. But there's no relation to more homes being built and employment in Hanford. Hanford's a totally separate, unrelated economic activity for the community. Fantastically important, but not related to home building. Unless they were to expand, and for a short term, then we'd hire, we'd build more houses for expansion in Hanford. But you get the point. So these things are not driving. More homes don't drive these activities. Even a beer bottler is probably not, is bottling beer for more than just the local community. They're bottling beer for the whole western half of Washington State or western Washington and then parts of Idaho or whatever it is, or northern Oregon, western, northwestern Oregon. You get the point. So this is the four reasons. Savings, buying stuff not made locally, going out of town, and this whole extra issue here. Our reasons the multiplier is as low as it is. And this model actually happens to be on the conservative side and doesn't push the multipliers all that much because it especially accounts for this issue. Now, let's continue with the. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's a large history of this model. This model's been around for about 15 or 16 years. For 13 years, I actually worked on this model quite extensively, presenting it and helping tweak it and twist it and improve it and so on and so forth. But this model, is, this results here are not uh, results that I was not intimately involved with because I work for myself now. But since I'm familiar with the model, it's, it's a fun thing to explain and I understand how it works quite well. But the intellectual property and the model aren't mine. And if by accident I happen to say we or us, I mean they or them, I happen to work on it for so many years that I feel some sort of ownership even though it's legitimately not mine. It's their intellectual property and so on. But the model's been around for a long time. There have been hundreds and hundreds, nearly a thousand of these models have been run. It's been done for a lot of places. Home builder associations, home builders, realtors, developers and so on. Universities, and here's a smattering of some of the places that have, that, that have used it to be done. All right, now, let's get now, we've finished with all the theory. We now, you now understand the basics of the model, the three phases, how big they are, and so on. Let's look at the crux of the issue now, and let's dial it down and look specifically at what's going on here in the Tri-Cities area. What are the houses on average cost that are built in the two counties here, Benton and so on? What's the story? New homes, about 265,000 bucks. The average raw lot, undeveloped, unplatted, and unzoned is roughly 11,000, 12,000 bucks. Infrastructure, permits, and fees to get permission to build infrastructure, not to actually do the building, just to get permission to do building, excavating and so on, you know, land disturbance fees and school fees and all that kind of stuff. The permission, builders and developers need permission slips to go forward on the product, the, pro the production. This is the cost of getting permission slips from government. And then there's annual property taxes on the house. So this is your story. The question now is, let's put it in this three phases, construction, ripple, occupancy, see how big they are, add up the benefits, and then we're going to look at the costs and see what the difference is, why, how big, and so on and so forth. See, so again, we're going to go through three phases, and we're going to add them all up and look over a 10-year, the sum of the benefits, and then we'll know how big the benefits are. So here's the first phase. This is when you build 1,000 homes. Again, this is a baseline number. Don't say, oh, we're actually building 1,000 homes. This year, you're actually building substantially more. Even in your worst years of 2009 and 10, you built, on the worst year, a slightly more than this. So we're using this number merely because of convenience. It's an easy round number to look at. If you want to look at 2,000 homes, just double everything. If you want 500 homes, divide everything by two. You get the idea. 100, just knock, take away one zero, and you have the effects of 100 homes. It's easy to multiply and divide to get to the actual number. 
So what you're getting when you build a thousand new homes in the community, priced two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars on average. So some can be four hundred thousand. There'll be a few at these very high prices, and there'll be some at the very low entry level prices as well. But on average, this is what you're getting. So you build a thousand homes, you get eighteen hundred jobs in the construction phase. That's a lot of jobs, and a lot of these jobs are in construction, of course. But a lot of them aren't in construction directly. They're in wholesale, retail, trade, and business and professional services. Now, what happens when the construction phase ends? We have the ripple phase. Why do we have the ripple phase? We have the ripple phase because look, the, in the, within the community now, we have roughly 150 million bucks we didn't have. Roughly 130 there and 20 here. That's $150 million. Because these 18, 1900 people are employed and there's taxes to government, and that money all gets spent. Only if the money doesn't get spent do you end up with zero in a ripple phase. There must be a ripple phase. Now, we can argue how big the multipliers are, as I mentioned, how much savings, and the government tells you this. There's, there's, there's good, good, good data, and there's some judgment calls here. But you can't argue there isn't, or it's, that it's far off from this number. And I think this number, again, is a relatively conservative number. So we've got 150 million bucks here, 18, 1900 jobs, and look at the ripple phase. Interestingly enough, so here we were. We were at 120, 130, we're at 60, roughly half. We were here at 20, we're now roughly at 10, roughly half. We were at 1,900, we're now roughly at 1,000, roughly half. There are no jobs here in construction. Now what's really interesting to focus in on is in, on the employment side, who benefits during this construction and ripple phase. And now we go from 60 million to 30, roughly half. Taxes don't fall that much from 12. Oh, from nine, they actually jump up to 12, so they, they stay at the, at the second level. And the jobs fall from roughly 2,000, it was roughly 2,000, right? Um, it was roughly 2,000, then it falls to roughly 1,000, now it falls to 500. The total revenue, if you look at taxes together, here almost 150 million, here about 70 million, and here about 40 million. Roughly speaking, this is a good shorthand. It varies from, you know, the tax is a little different. But the rest, it's all really close. And here, there's 500 more jobs. So we have 1,000 jobs here, 2,000 jobs almost here, about 1,000 jobs here, 500 here. The important thing here is these jobs, they stay forever. So we had 3,000 jobs, roughly, right? 2,000 and 1,000, roughly. That's that. And we had 500 here into, per into perpetuity. And then we add up all the income. The income is really, really big because we're picking up 20 million in taxes right away, and then 10 million in tax, or it's $30 million, and then 12 million more every single year. That gets you 150 million bucks in taxes. That's a lot of money. It's deceptively large. You know, essentially, nine years at $12 million gets you 120, and the, and the 20 million plus the 10 million gets you 150 million dollars. Similarly, here, this is an exceptionally a lot of money. This is, this, is, this is more than I make in a year, let's put it that way. Picking up 127 million up front, plus 60 more, so roughly 200 million up front, and then 30 million for nine more years. And you add it up, you get 465 million bucks. You build a thousand single fam homes at the average price of 260,000 or 264, nothing particularly unusual. And you're creating 600 million, roughly 600 million dollars of economic stimulus to the community between taxes of 150 million roughly and, 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 and local income of 450 million. This is big. It's deceptively large because we're forgetting all the little chump chains that goes on. We're, we're forgetting most of the occupancy effect. All we're picking up is property taxes when there's way more than that. We're missing entirely the ripple phase. And that's why we, we underestimate the benefits housing brings to a community. And we have to understand what they are before we can have a really good political dialogue. We can take out sharp knives and sh shred each other politically if we want to. That's fine. That's what politics is about. But let's not have this fight being ignorant about the facts. Let's understand the facts. Then we can take out our knives and kill each other. I'm, that's fine. I'm, I have no argument about there. Politics can be a dirty game and a difficult game at times. Now, let's put this into perspective because you're not going to remember what i said to you as compelling as a speaker i am i'm fearful you're going to forget some small detail perhaps so let's put it in terms that are very easy to understand how important 
if you look at just the construction phase, how important are the jobs? It's only in the construction phase. That's 1,300 construction jobs and the other four or 500 non-construction jobs, right? And it's the gas station and the restaurants and all like haircuts and so on, shoe stores and so on, that are contributing to that 1,883 jobs. If you look at all the employers here in town, it turns out when they build 1,000 single fam homes, which was the lowest number of homes built in, the, in, the recent, in recent history, and this is history going back 10, 15 years, not two or three. This shows it's the sixth or seventh largest, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh largest employer. So if the home building industry were one big factory, if you will, right, and had one big presence, it would be easier to understand its benefit. But because it's dispersed and they build a few homes here and a few homes there and there's 10 here and 20 there and 60 there, and there's a refrigeration company here and a sewage company there. And you don't realize how many jobs collectively this industry creates. But it's on, it's on par with the Pasco School District. And imagine when home building is better, like it is already this year, and we're going to build closer to 1,400 or 1,500 homes. This number goes up by 50%. We're at 26. So it's not inconceivable that by the end of this year, home building will be the second or third. Not the second, those are a little bigger, but certainly the third biggest. And in a really good year, it could conceivably be the second largest home, the largest employer in the metro area. That's unusual. So it brings in a lot of revenue we don't realize. And because of that, we don't realize all the jobs it creates. So when we do things to, to make it more difficult to build homes, we've got to keep this in mind. We may decide to do them, fine, but understand the impact that are being caused as a result. Now, I've given you half a story at this point. But as you all know, there is no free lunch in economics. You never get something for nothing. There's always a price to pay. The benefits we've looked at result because people move here to, and buy a house and like the community. And part of the reason they like the community is because it's a great place to live. There's nice parks. There are decent schools. There are good roads. There's good public health care, and on and on and on. So we have to think about those costs if we're going to do this analysis justice. We can't just stop and say, wow, big benefits. That's somewhat incomplete. That's like going to a restaurant, eating the menu, food, and saying, wow, delicious meal, and not paying. Right? That would be the intellectual equivalent to this. So let's begin now and think about the costs that are incurred when you build a house. All these things that local governments and county governments have to provide. This is very expensive. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about this. Government is an exceptionally expensive service to provide because it's both very capital intensive and very labor intensive. You've got to build a lot of buildings and you've got to hire a lot of people to provide this or outsource it. But it's very expensive. Turns out to provide a year of services to a house, $7,000. Box. It's very expensive. Providing services are expensive. Now, your numbers are a little bit skewed. They're a little weird because you've got a power, power company here that does all kinds of, they, they bring in lots of money and it costs lots of money both. This is a very unusual story. This is not the normal situation. But again, you've got hydro issues, you've got, you got power issues. Not that it's good or bad, not what I'm saying. Or it loses money. I'm not saying that either. It's just every place has got their own unique story. This is your most unusual story. But you have to think, every time a house is built, the community collectively has to spend $7,000 to provide that household with services. We assume all households get the same quality services. We're looking at only single fam homes, right? We're assuming they all get the same, and the new ones get the same as the existing ones. We're not discriminating against new ones versus old ones, or bigger houses versus smaller houses, or houses in Kennewick versus houses in Pasco, or whatever. We're looking at all of them, treating them all the same. On average, that's legitimate, even though we know that some houses, of course, get different levels of service, because different cities here have different levels of service. That's the reason they have different cities. Are we done yet? Is this the only cost? This is an annual cost. Every year, 7,000 bucks roughly to provide services to this new household and existing households. What other service, what, what are we forgetting? We're forgetting something big here, really big. I'll give you a hint. If we, if we have new kids, we have to hire new teachers, right? Where do we put the teachers? Schools, yeah. You have good public schools here, obviously, because you, you got the right answer. If we hire more policemen, to police the new communities, where we put policemen generally? Police stations. So we're going to have to build a piece of a school. This is a piece of a teacher and a piece of a fireman for that one house. 
Now we're going to have to build a little piece of a school, a little piece of a fire station, a little bit, bit of a public hospital to, a, to, to, to where these people can live and work to provide services to these new households. This is an annual cost, 7,000 bucks. Think of it down here, 7,000 bucks forever. But there's a one-time capital cost of 11,000 bucks. This is building pieces of infrastructure. Now, this one's a little bit more complicated, but there's a methodology in public finance to help figure out what it is. There's a well-developed literature on answering this specific question of how much capital do you need? And based on your population and the existing capital you have and the age of the capital, you can backwards estimate it. That's what economists do for a living, okay? So this is an estimate. It may not, this number is very, very accurate. This number is less accurate, but on average very close. Maybe it's 12, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 9, maybe it's 13. It's roughly in this ballpark. We're cl it's close. I'm sure it's close, but I'm not, this one's not an estimate. This one's the actual number. So let's think about this before we go to the next step. There are three benefits housing brings to a community. There's the construction phase that's eight or nine months, and it's over. There's the ripple phase that lasts as long as the construction phase lasts. It's half as big. It lasts eight or nine months, and then it's over. And then comes the occupancy effect, which is half as big again, roughly. Remember, 1,000, 2,000 jobs, roughly, 1,000 jobs, roughly, 500 jobs, roughly. This phase lasts forever. On the cost side, there are two types of costs. There's the first slide, let's go back one here, that's 7,000 bucks a year. This is the cost of providing public services every year at that house. Clean water, sewer, schools, fire, police, public recs, and all that sort of stuff. Every year. And then there's a one-time cost of $11,000 that only occurs once. The question now becomes, are the revenues generated by that house over 10 or 20 year or 5 year or 30 year period, whatever the length of time in the analysis is, is it are those revenues big enough to bring in, bring in enough taxes to cover the cost of $7,000 a year and $11,000 once? That's the crux of the issue, right? Does housing pay its way? If so, how quickly? And by how much? Those are the key questions. This is the answer. I will explain it in a moment. But let's get to the kicker and work backwards. The punchline is, by the end of the first year, all the capital costs have been paid off. You have to pay teachers and policemen that 7000 a year we talked about. That has to happen every year. You can't delay that. There's no ands, ifs, or buts. You do that, you get sued, and there's all kinds of problems. But you don't necessarily have to pay off the capital of 11000 bucks in the first year. You can pay that off over a long time. I mean, after all, it lasts 50 or 60 years. Sewer systems and school buildings, they last a long time. They don't go away fast. So the question is, once you get all the revenue, pay off the teachers, with the leftover money, pay interest on the bonds that you float to pay the capital, and then pay the capital off. By the end of the first year, there's nothing left. Let's figure out how we get this. So the, the first year, the revenues and the expenses are very different than in all subsequent years, right? Notice this is $7,100 per house, right? Remember that number? $7,000 a year times 1,000 houses is $7 million. That's where we get that number. We show here $12 million in taxes every year, right? In the occupancy phase, right? So every single year, the revenues after the first year, revenue of 12 million, costs are seven, difference is five. That's positive five million. The reason it's positive, essentially, is because these homes are relatively large. Are there realtors in the audience? What's the average price or median price of a home in the Tri-Cities area? 185. Fine, but these homes cost 264. So they're 40, 50 percent more money than the existing homes, which means the homeowners have relatively more disposable income, higher incomes, more disposable income, they spend more money, and so on and so forth. That's one of the reasons these homes are so economically valuable. Because if they were a $185,000 home, the expenses wouldn't change, school, police, and fire, but the revenues would be lower because the tax would be lower, they go out to eat less, and so on and so forth. So the benefit of these new homes, in part, is simply their price. They are the more valuable to the community because they're more expensive. And you want people who have higher incomes to move here, too. If you don't build homes, they won't come. Nothing to accommodate them. They'll say, oh, I can't live here. I'll live in ya God-forsaken Yakima. <laughs> Whoa, or I'll move to Moses Lake. Yikes. 
or, or no good Spokane or something. These horrible places. You want to save them from a life of misery and destitution. You have to provide houses. Save these poor people. They don't deserve this fate worse than death, do they? Now, in the first year, the expenses are half as big as in all subsequent years. Because homes that are built in vintage 2012 are not all built on Jan 1, are they? No. They're built over 12 months. So if you assume one twelfth of the homes are built every single month, that means instead of hiring one teacher the first year, you'll need only half a teacher because you only have half the number of homes because the Jan 1 homes need a full year of service. The December 31st homes need no service, on average half. So that's why this number is super low. This number is super high, however, because not only do you really get the, the benefits of the third, the, the third phase occupancy effect, essentially, but you also pick up all the construction phase taxes and all the ripple phase taxes. It only happens once, but you get them and they're really big, right? It's like 20 million and 10 million or something like that. So it ends up being 36 million bucks. So what we do here actually, the first phase was 20 million in taxes roughly, right? The second phase is roughly 10 million in taxes. That's 30 million. And then there's 12 million every year thereafter. But the first year, remember, only half a teacher, half a policeman, half a, half a property tax payment. You also only get half a property tax payment. So the 12 million in all subsequent years is only 6 million the first. So you have the full construction phase taxes, the full ripple taxes, and only half of the occupancy taxes because the December 31st house doesn't pay any property taxes, whereas the Jan 1st house pays the full property taxes on average here. So it's 20 million plus 10 million plus six more gets you roughly 36 million with some rounding numbers. So you have huge revenues the first year and then the flat revenue thereafter. Half the cost the first year, the flat different, the difference becomes here. So this becomes the, 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 the net revenue, if you will, or the operating surplus, whatever you want to call it. But we're not done yet because we still haven't built capital. And the capital was $11,000 per house, right? 1,000 homes, 11 million bucks. But we have an operating surplus of 33 million. Let's borrow $11 million, pay interest on that money, low rate of interest, Interest rates are pretty low now, 3 4%. Take this money, pay off the interest, pay off the principal, and the leftover is net revenue. So these homes are bringing in 21 million bucks in net revenue their very first year. Let's suppose I'm wrong. I mentioned earlier this $11 million was not an exact number. Let's say it's double, not $11,000 a year, not one time for capital, schools, roads, and sewers, but say it's $22,000 just to make them, just to, just, to, just to think about it. I don't have a slide, but it's okay. We double this number to $22 million, right? $22 million, double this to a million roughly, right? Roughly. So $22 million and one is $23 million. From $33 million, you still got $10 million bucks left over. And these numbers don't change. So if the, if the capital costs are double what, we, what I think they are, sorry, what the model thinks it is, not my model, their model, this falls by half to 10 million roughly. Okay, this is why I don't really get very angst-ridden when someone says, well, you know, what if the model you're using or reporting on here and talking about is incorrect? What if the capital costs are 5,000 higher or $10,000 higher? What I basically say is I use an economic term, and that term is it doesn't really matter. I'm not sitting here worrying. I'm not balancing on a knife edge, you know, where a slight change in the weight will tip and destroy the whole result. This result's pretty robust. What if we raised interest rates and doubled interest rates from three or four percent to eight percent, and this doubled to eight hundred thousand from four hundred thousand? This fell, would fall from twenty one six to twenty million eight hundred thousand. Again, who cares? This is a pretty robust outcome. It's almost, it's impossible, almost, it's completely impossible to think up a scenario where we have really high cost of capital, super high interest rates, and some weird junk going on to get this number negative, let alone these numbers. And what if by chance, by chance, this number was four times higher? It wasn't 11,000, it was 44,000. This becomes 44 million, this becomes 2 million. Now you got 46 million, right? From, 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 from 33, you're down by 13 million dollars. Well, one, two, three years, you pay it off. 
Fine. So if the capital costs are forty-four thousand bucks a house, and that's just impossibly high. I mean, you can build each person like a like a chateau in Versailles for almost for that much money. You'd pay off housing in three years or four years, not less than one year. So I'm pretty convinced this is right. Again, you know, it could be off by a couple of days or some dollars here or there or something. But the basic concept of the tax re revenues being generated are more than enough to cover the costs. Now. I want to put this into perspective. This is important. Now, what happens as a result of this? Where does the money go? It goes into the budget. The, the counties and cities and school districts know this money is coming because they know every year homes are built. And therefore, they budget accordingly. Oh, we know we're going to have that new housing money. They don't think of it as that. It's just part of the general budget, and they know it every year it happens because they always build a thousand homes. So it's sort of just a, it's like you know when you were a kid, you know you were what you were ten years old, and your parents gave you an allowance of a dollar or fifty cents or something. You knew you had that money every every week or whatever it was, right? You had chores to do, whatever, but you got the money. Same thing here. You don't think about it. It's just there. And if it weren't there, you'd have to raise your taxes. Raise your hands if you want higher taxes. And now, oh, the alternative is lower services. Raise your hands if you want less service. We'll pick up your trash once a year. How does that sound? Appealing, you'd save all your garbage bags in your garage or something, right? So this is reducing your, 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 your property taxes or your sales taxes or uh, something is being reduced here, right? Not income, of course, because you're in Washington had income. But you get the point. Now, let's put it into perspective. I'm telling you, you're paying off housing in less than housing pays for the capital road, sewers, and police stations in less than a year. Think of the expensive, large, lumpy things you buy, expensive capital things you buy or invest in. And the simplest things to think about are, are, are transportation, cars are expensive, education is expensive, and shelter. These are the three most expensive things most people buy. Occasionally, it's a horse or diamond ring, you know, an airplane. I'm not familiar with those situations. I'd like to be, maybe I will. There was a recently a $33 million yacht drove through town, right? Okay, that would alter the economics here tremendously. But think about it, how fast you pay off your car. If I told you, sir, you could pay off your student loans, your car loans, and your house loans, so all your debt in 10 years, would you be happy? Oh, yeah. yeah. If I told you it was seven years, would you be happy? If I told you six years, would you be happy? If I told you three years, would you be happy? You'd be happier than them, you'd all, but you'd all be happy. If I told you a year and a half, would you be happy? So well, the point is here, don't perseverate. Don't focus on that it's less than one year. That's very fast, maybe too fast, because you're, you're paying off a long-lived asset in an exceptionally short period of time. It's like, it's like paying off your home in the first year you own the home. That would mean a very emaciated waistline and very bad lifestyle, because you'd be broke. So you could actually change your fiscal situation. I'm not suggesting you do that. But I'm saying you're very conservative here. You pay off things quickly, and you've got, you pay off things very, very fast compared to you know, the things you think about in your lifetime. Now, I'm just about done here. But I want to leave you with an intuitive reason for why what I'm saying is right. Because many of you, I bet, have heard somewhere, housing doesn't pay its way. Housing is not a good investment for our community. Housing is a financial drain on the existing homeowners. It's the existing homeowners like you who are going to subsidize me when I move here and buy a house. Hopefully, I've convinced you that's not the case. But I want you to understand why. Because at some level, you have to trust me. And uh, I'm an honest guy, but A, you don't know that. B, I don't come from here. I'm not part of your community. I could just come and leave and lie and you know, wreck your finances up and then whatever. It's not my problem, it's yours. So I want to give you an intuitive understanding for why what I'm saying is true. I've alluded to some of it already by saying the price of these homes is higher. If you built more homes that cost $185,000, the benefits would be much reduced, and they'd probably be pretty close to neutral. All right? Because on average, all the homes you have are neutral. The expensive homes pay more than their way. You know, Bill Gates moved here, or, or Larry Ellison, when he has that big cup he won, the America's Cup now, he has all this extra money. He buys a house here, it costs 14 million bucks. He's paying his way in like nine seconds, right? By contrast, you know, my daughter moves here and she gets a job paying eight bucks an hour, lives in a rental, rent, a low income housing tax credit place. It never pays its way. I mean, you've got. I understand you've got vast discrepancies going on. I'm looking at the, uh, the weighted average, so I'm accounting for the volume of the dollars and the volume of payments. So here's the first explanation why we underestimate the benefits. 
we know that the taxes the house pays are about 3,000 bucks, about one and a quarter percent of the house price. House costs 260,000 bucks, property taxes are 3,300, one and a quarter, one and a third percent ballpark. But is that the only tax the household pays? That's lunacy. Do you guys here have cell phones by chance? You pay a cell phone tax every month to the city, the county, the state, whatever, not the state, this is not a state analysis, we don't care about state. But the city, county, you have, do you have water in your house, miss? Do you have water in your house? You pay tax on the water? Yeah. You have sewer in your house, sir? You pay water tax in your sewer every month? You have cable TV, you pay tax? I mean, you add up all the taxes you pay, local sales tax, all this stuff together, it becomes exceptionally large. And because these homes are more expensive, this number is much, much higher. If it were a lower priced home, say half the price, say 140,000 to make the math easy, this number would be roughly, not exactly, but roughly six, six and a half thousand bucks. More expensive homes bring in more economic benefit. The costs don't really change much. That's one reason we really mess up the analysis. We're a little lazy, we think about what we know, and we extrapolate forward. And you make errors along the way here, and you get bad outcomes. Now before I get to the second analysis, second explanation for why what I'm saying is right, I want to ask you a question. How many kids in the average house? You build 100 homes, how many kids? Two, 2.5, three. Have I got the consensus of the group here? Okay. I don't know how to put this carefully to you. See, I'm a guest here. I, I've always been taught never to insult my host and hostess. I'm going to have to insult you all now and say that you're all idiots. It pains me to say it, but you're all wrong. You're all completely wrong. The actual number of kids per house is about half a child. You think it's two or three and it's a half a child. This is the primary reason why you're wrong. Now, I, I see a, a head in the audience saying, I've got to be wrong. Got to be wrong. Got to be wrong, right? Here's the hard math. The U.S. population is 320 million people. The U.S. population grows by 3 million people a year, roughly 9 tenths of 1 percent. That's math. To get that population growth, you have to have about half a kid a house. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. I'm now going to prove that I'm right in front of you and make liars out of all of you. I want you to raise your hands if you have more, two kids or more in the public schools because that's what we care about. We care about education. That's the big expense, generally. Raise your hands. Two kids or more in public schools. One, two, one, kid, one person can't make up mind. Three, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half people in this whole room have two kids or more. Now that means those six of you have to have like 14 children each to make up for all the deadbeats who have none. Now you can argue this is not a fair question because this audience is slightly older than people with fa big families because they're, they have to be younger to have three kids. You've got to be under 40 roughly or 45 because the kids are already moving away. I can tell you have no kids in the house because you have no hair, it's obvious. And your friend behind you in the Hawaiian shirt, no, no, no kids either. You know, I can look at you and probably guess you have no kids in the house and you either have no kids. Yeah, grandkids maybe, deadbeat grandkids who, re who boomerang back. But the grandkids don't count, they're not your kids. All right, so the argument is, hey, younger families would have bigger, would have bigger households, right? Sure, I agree with you, but they can't afford all to buy a house. You have to have enough money to buy a $206,000 house. People who buy, the, the families that have lots of kids buy the cheaper houses because they can't afford to buy the because they aren't old enough and they haven't saved up enough money. No matter how you slice the situation, there are two ways to think about this analysis. Now, you, I, I challenge you to go home and do it at a level. One level is go to your school district and say, how many kids in the school district? They'll tell you 1,000, 800, whatever the number is, numerator. The denominator is how many households in that community. Census will give you that data. Divide the number of kids by the number of households and by God you will get roughly half a kid because that's what it has to be. The other way to think about this is longitudinally. Longitudinally will go like this. What's, that? what's, what's your name is? Lori. Lori. Okay, Lori, I love you. I'm going to marry you. So let's pretend we're married now. Okay, we're married. I find you very attractive and you're fun and you're vivacious and you love economics. That's the most important thing, right? Okay, good. So we do this. Now, we're, we're a very old-fashioned couple. We court, then we get married, then we buy a house, 
then we have kids. That old traditional method. Or we have kids and then buy a house. The old fashioned way. Nowadays, you first have kids, then you court, you never get married, and then you get divorced or something. <laughs> but bear with me. There's a point here. So we get married, and let's make the math really simple. We have twins. Well, you have twins right off the bat. We have no more kids. We're done. So the first year we're living in the house, we have no kids, right? Zero. The second year, we have two kids. And then for the next 17 years, we have two kids in the house until they finish grade 12. Then we throw the kids out. We go on safari for a couple years, buy a camper or whatever. Okay? And then we have no kids in the house for 30 more years. And then romantically, we both die on the same day. Beautiful. We're holding hands. We just die, expire at the same time. We live in the house 60 years. I'm making the numbers up here as I go, roughly. 60 years. Of those 60 years, for 17 years, we had two kids. But for the remaining 40 years, roughly, we had no kids. This has to happen. It happens because your children get older. You may forget this. I know you are always a parent. Once a parent, always a parent. But your children don't remain eight. They, every year, they get roughly a year older. If they travel at the speed of light, aging differs. But essentially, since no one's in a rocket ship here approaching warp speed, we don't have that problem. They roughly age 12 months every, every 365 days. And after 18 or 19 years or 70, they're out of the house and off the public dole, not going to public school. That's the most important number. That's the story. Now, if you add to it the fact that Washington State gives a tremendous amount of state aid, a massive amount of state aid for K through 12 education. Huge amounts. The total cost to the local communities of providing K through 12 education is very, very low. The budget may be very big because you're getting lots of subsidies from Olympia. You're paying you know, prop sales taxes that goes to Olympia, and Olympia shovels it back to the local governments in the form of intergovernmental transfers to pay for K through 12 education. I get it. It's not that it's free. You're paying for it either way. I understand that. But it's not, it, it's not local revenue that has to be derived. It's, it's, it's some state sales taxes that's paying most of the freight here, or other taxes and so on. So let's play a little game. I need two volunteers. One of you will be humiliated. The second person who volunteers will be humiliated, but the first person won't. That's an incentive to volunteer. Because if I pick you, I'll humiliate you. Any volunteers? Come on. Somebody? Somebody? You. You're one. You're one. And you're the second one. Okay, so you're, you're the volunteer. Joe and Tonya. Two volunteers. Thank you both. So, Tonya, you're going to be smart. And you, as the script tells us, are a bozo. And I want to explain to you how these errors of assumptions about educational costs can really get out of whack, get you totally misperceive what's going on. So you think there are two kids per house because you're an idiot. You're smart. You know the total number of kids isn't even one. It's half of one. It's only half. Let's now take an easy number and say it costs 10,000 bucks a year to educate a kid. I'm pulling out a hat, but let's just go with it. All right, Joe, two kids times 10,000 bucks a kid means every single year the total cost of educating your household is 20,000. 20, By contrast, Tonya, you know it's only half a 5,000 per kid, uh, 10,000 a kid, only half a kid per house. Therefore, the 10,000 is cut in half. It's only? Roughly 5,000. Right. So the people in the know know it's 5,000 bucks a year, and the jerks out there think it's 20. But now let's do one more thing. Let's take that $5,000 and reduce it. Let's not reduce it by 95% because there's no knowledge in the future it will continue. Times are tough. The state may cut back on K through 12 education. Let's just cut it, make the math easy here. Let's make it 50%. The state aid is cut back from 95 to 50%. Therefore, the $5,000 is cut in half and is now only? 2,500. Right. So Tonya knows it's only 2,500 bucks a year to educate an average household's worth of kids. By contrast, dumb Joe still thinks it's the full 20. 20K. That's a huge difference. You don't have to be a PhD in economics to understand that 2,500 is not 20,000. But now let's go back and exacerbate the error with my prior slide. This gets fun. Now, Joe, because he's stupid, thinks the $20,000 has to be funded from the $3,000 in property taxes. Joe, you're on the prices right, and I'm Bob Barker, okay? 
you go into a showcase showdown or something, is twelve thousand is is twenty thousand dollars a year in educational costs higher or lower than three thousand dollars in property taxes? Higher. Right. Very good. You're in the showcase showdown. Very good. You and Vanna White, and we're all set. Okay. You've made two errors here. You've overestimated education costs and you've underestimated revenues. But this is what most people do. Uh, right? You're smart. You know the details. You met this guy Eisenberg who wears a bow tie and he's funny. You know the average cost to educate the household's kids is only? And the total revenue generated by the house, new house at that price level is twelve and a half thousand. And suddenly there's ten thousand bucks left over. That, my friends, is the story in a nutshell. If you underestimate benefits and overestimate costs, you're Joe. And if you properly estimate the benefits and pro the cost, you're Tanya. It's a big difference. And you can do all the econometrics and the statistical analysis and the modeling and the data sources and checking and rechecking, yeah. But that really is what it boils down to. There's a lot more revenue than property taxes and a lot less expenses than you think because our households are much smaller than they are. They have to be. Now, to, 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 there are naysayers who are still going to be out there that I'm lying about the numbers of kids. What state in the union has the most kids per household? It's not far from here. It's Montana. Or excuse me. Oregon? No. Utah. Yes. The nights are long and cold and the wives are many. <laughs> 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 and all the alpha males get the women or something, okay? I'm joking. I'm joking. I know there's no polygamy. I get it. I do. I do. But they're, pop they're, they're the state with the fastest population growth of births over deaths anywhere else. The na nationally, the model actually has the right numbers here for Washington, for, for Pasco, Kenwick, Richland. It's not 0.6 for national. This is national. The model has the actual numbers in it. What do you think this number is for Utah? Close. It's 0.84. So the fastest in the country is 0.84. The notion that it's two or two and a half is complete bugaboo. That's the single most important reason why we overestimate costs and really don't want housing. Now, we may not want housing because we don't want people cooking with funny spices and celebrating funny holidays who look different than us and have wear funny clothes. Okay, that happens everywhere. That's just the way people are. We all hate each other. I get it. I'm joking. Tom Lehrer had a very good song about this if you're old enough. You know. But the point is we have to get the data right. It's important to have a good debate. We've got to have the right facts. And I'd like to think that I'm helping to improve the quality of debate. I want to leave you with a, a thought experiment, if you will. No, not a thought, it's a real example kind, but a thought experiment. Let's suppose you, miss, are a city manager. And you have two choices. You can go behind door number A or door number B. You know, Monty Hall, one's a goat or something, right? One of them. Now, you're not sure where to go, and all you know is one piece of information. Behind door number A is a fast-growing city. And behind door number B is a city that's not grown at all in 50 years. And that's the only piece of info you have. And you think to yourself, hmm, let's think. If housing, if housing doesn't pay its way, where would I want to be as a city manager? The fast-growing city or the non-growing city? The non-growing city, of course, because housing doesn't pay its way. You'll go to that city. It's Buffalo, New York. It's Dayton, Ohio. It's Syracuse, New York. It's a bunch of these cities that don't grow. And as a result, they have a lot of fiscal trouble. By contrast, behind door number A is Charlotte, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas, Oklahoma City, and so on and so forth. Now, where do you want to work as a city manager? Door number A with the fast growing cities or door number B with the slow or non growing cities? Door a. Right. That's the point. The proof is in the pudding. Now, that proof, that what I just told you, doesn't prove housing pays its way because it could be that houses are a loser, but the, but the, but the retail establishments and the, and, the, and the strip malls and the office buildings and the industrial parks are the ones that make all the money and they pay off the loss that occurs in the new homes. But even if that's the case, because this analysis doesn't even pick up the industrial and commercial stuff, right? We're not getting that at all. We're just looking at the residential stuff all by itself, assuming they have a job. So they're working somewhere, but we're not picking up the property taxes from those work establishments places, the law firm and so on, or the supermarket or whatever. If you add that in, it's much better. So growth does pay its way. It's probably 
because housing is contributing as well as commercial and industrial. But even if housing doesn't pay its way, you can't get the commercial and the industrial without building the houses to get the rooftops to have the stores come and appeal to, to, to move to come here and open up a, a TGI Friday or a new restaurant or a new school, you know, whatever it is, something, a new, a new supermarket or a, you know, a nice wine bar or something along those lines. I hope I've given you a feeling and an intuitive understanding for why what I've said is true. I would like to help you go forward. If I can help you in some way, I would be happy to do so. And if you want, I send out every single day a 70-word economic snippet. Give me your business card before you leave, and I'll put you on. If you don't have a business card, email me. Just give it to me here or put it down right here, and I'll put you on. In a couple days, you'll start hearing 70 words a day on me about economics and data and demography and politics, but mostly economics. You've been a wonderful audience. I've probably gone on too far. I'm not sure what's next on the agenda, but I'm going to pass it off to the CEO of the Home Builders, Jeff Losey, and I thank you all very, very much.